welcome again to the Empowering Neurologist. I am Dr. David Perlmutter. Today we're going to be talking about food allergy. And right off the bat, we're going to explore exactly what that term means and then do a deep dive into the prevalence of this issue, which can be life-threatening and is certainly life-changing, not just for the individuals who have food allergies, but certainly uh, their families as well. It's a big problem affecting between 7 to 11 percent of America's population. So we really need to gain an understanding of this and ask ourselves why is this problem increasing in its prevalence with time. We're going to be looking at this book, The End of Food Allergy, interviewing its author, Dr. Carrie Nado, and she will be uh, joining us. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she is the professor of medicine and pediatrics and a director of the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research uh, at Stanford University. She is Section Chief in Asthma and Allergy in Pulmonary and Critical Care, again at Stanford, and she is a pediatrician and practices allergy, asthma, and immunology in both children and adults. Uh, she received her MD degree as well as her PhD, both from Harvard Medical School, and then completed a residency in pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and a clinical fellowship in asthma and immunology at Stanford and at the University of California, uh, San Francisco. She has overseen more than 40 clinical trials and enrolled more than 2,000 patients in various types of allergy studies. And uh, in addition, she has published over 240 peer-reviewed publications. We've got a lot to learn. I'm very excited about our interview today, so let's jump right in. Hello, Dr. Nado. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. I've, uh, I enjoy your work. I enjoyed your book. And uh, I think we have a lot of great information uh, to, to give to our listeners today. What you're talking about seems to be a, a very big and I would say to some degree unrecognized problem. So I think part of your mission, I, I watched your TEDx talk, by the way, and part of your mission, I think, is to kind of w raise public awareness as to how big of an issue this is. Absolutely. I think for the longest time, this was a disease that a lot of people didn't understand. And because of that, there were a lot of people in the public that didn't take it as seriously as perhaps they should have. And I think now, in the 20 years that I've been working in this field, you can really understand that this is a huge disabling disease. It is an epidemic in its own right. It's doubling every 10 years for some of these tree nut allergies. And it's a disease that's prominent in children, but it also happens in adults. So for 8% of children in the US to be affected by this, for 10% of adults to have a doctor's diagnosis of a food allergy, these numbers should worry us. And that's what I'm also trying to make sure in the book, as well as when I talk to the public to say, these numbers are real. They're happening. How do we prevent it? And how can we treat it? Well, you've given a, a lot of bullet points right off the bat. We can take uh, any one of these and, and spend our time together. Um, I, I'd like to explore the notion of this uh, continued increased prevalence that you just described. You start your book by saying, I'm going to read a quote, the rise of allergy is not separate from many other dire issues that we are confronting. So what are these other issues that we are confronting and how might they uh, relate to the increasing prevalence of food allergy? It's an excellent question. Thank you so much, Dr. Perlmutter. So I think first is that we are a society that is living in a changing environment. And that's one of the things we emphasize in the book is that those environmental changes are such that we can't go back in time. It used to be that when we grew up in farms and we grew up with a lot of animals around us, there was a less likelihood of having those allergies because we were being constantly incubated with our microbiome and good bacteria. Now there were some bad bacteria back in the day as well. So science has taken us very far, but unfortunately now with those natural ways to interact with our environment, for people that live in the city, for people that have a typical life where they're working in the office, that isn't done. So those environmental changes are part of the picture as to why we think allergies are on the rise. The other part that we talk about in the book is that food is different. The food on our table is different. And we need to diversify the diet early and often for babies because that's what used to be done for our grandparents. 
And unfortunately, the way that people have moved forward is to be so careful about food intake that in fact, those restrictions early in life have actually countered the natural processes that should have happened and actually are increasing the risk of allergies. And then finally, global climate change is real and that is affecting our food security, our ability to be exposed to smoke, pollution, different toxicants, and those are affecting how our immune system is then responding to items like COVID, to items like foods. So we have a lower threshold sometimes after being exposed to a lot of toxins and pollutions with global climate change to then having allergies and asthma. So we talk about all those different frameworks of the environment changing and why we might be seeing the food allergy increase. It brings to mind what the original explanation in terms of the, the people living uh, in more rural environments, uh, the idea that we have over sterilized our environments. And uh, th as Dr. Strachan talked about uh, in, I uh, forget what year it was, um, 1989, I believe, That's presenting right. what was called, came to be known as the hygiene hypothesis that you know, this lack of exposure is not doing us any good. As a matter of fact, it's degrading uh, the uh, competence of our immune systems. And in fact, you know, that's what a food allergy is. It's just a, a dysregulation of, an, of our immune system but subsequently became known as the old friend hypothesis when we realized that we really need this exposure to myriad uh, organisms at the time of our birth, at the time of our, uh, during our uh, childhood, and even later in life to continue to um, confront our immune systems and basically educate our immune systems. And you know, very taken that in short order here, we've been talking now for just a few minutes, we're looking at the gut. And you know, when you recognize 70 to 80% of our immune cells are clustered around the gut, why shouldn't we be having this conversation? So we're seeing uh, a, a real difference uh, around the globe in the prevalence of food allergy. And I'd like to put up uh, a, uh, an image from your book. We'll put that up right now. And just walk us through what we are seeing here in terms of where uh, countries are having more troubles than others. Sure. Oh, thank you. So with this image, you can see that there's an increase and in rise in food allergies around the world. And there are no boundaries in terms of people with food allergies. It affects all socioeconomic strata. It affects all ethnicities. Some ethnicities have some food allergies more than others. And importantly, it's global. The trends are increasing. We used to not know trends for, let's say, China and South America. And it was thought to be, like you were mentioning, that the old friend or the hygiene hypothesis, that if we were in a country with enough exposure to microbiome, that that would somehow decrease your risk of allergies. And for the most part, that was the case. But then after enough detergents were used, after the dietary changes occurred, we did start seeing food allergies in these other countries like Brazil and China. And it was interesting because those countries on the world map that um, you're showing, those countries that have a decreased rate are the ones that diversified their diet with their children very early. And they're also the countries that use fermented foods. And like you mentioned about the gut, it's so important to treat the gut well and to make sure we're not using a lot of detergents in our water so that our beautiful gut is not broken down by some of these bad detergents that we teach and educate the immune system with our babies as well as throughout life with diverse proteins. And we made sure that we eat healthy diets with good vitamins. And then lastly, that these countries that we thought were relatively protected um, in the hygiene hypothesis are not anymore, that we really need to be active in our approach to select foods that are fermented or that have good microbiomes so that we can replenish our gut and replenish our immune system to behave in a better fashion that's not allergic. Hmm. You know, uh, you mentioned detergent, and uh, at the end of the book, you talk about the six Ds, and I think detergent was one of them. And it's in the context, though, which is, I think, very surprising, that the skin seems to be playing such a big role uh, in, in food allergies. So can you just walk us through maybe some of the dynamics of how the skin is so involved? Sure. You know, 
our skin is our first entry point for a lot of things. Um, and it's really there to be a barrier. And the thing about the skin is it's anywhere in our body that touches the air, as you know. So we have skin on the outside of our surface, but also skin on the inside and in our esophagus and our lungs, anything that touches the air is essentially skin. And so in a way with evolution being that it is, when a parasite came or when a mosquito landed on the skin or when we somehow swallowed something that was not right and that was foreign, our body for thousands of years has this immediate response built into it via the immune system. It's called the alarming pathway. And we talk a little bit about this in the book because it's important for the setup. So bear with me on the symbolism here. But when you get attacked by a sea urchin or a mosquito or a tapeworm, your body wants to expel it. So it makes your body itch and red and tries to make sure that you as a person know that that is in your body so you can try to take it off. A bee sting, for example when it's something that you've eaten that's not supposed to be eaten or breathed in something that's not supposed to be breathed in, it makes a lot of mucus. It tries to make that skin surface slippery to expel the parasite or the smoke. And with that, now we're seeing that the allergic pathways that are now being um, really prevalent in our society, about one third of people have allergies and they still have that response, but it's been misplaced. And it's been dysfunctional so that pollen and foods create the same huge response in a very immediate way that can occur within seconds to minutes. And so it's through the skin that allergies can begin. And the skin is there to protect us, but when it's broken down and when it has, even on the surface that we can't even see, small little tears in it and the skin is disrupted, then the allergens from the air can get into the skin and you see this immediate response, mucus, itchiness, and it happens in some people, not everyone. And that alarm and pathway is driven to overreaction. And it's driven to a state where that person becomes allergic because of the skin. And so in babies that have eczema, when they have enough, even in small levels, in the air of pollens that are getting into their dry skin or food particles in the air. Dr. Broth in the United Kingdom has shown that if you have peanut dust in the air and it settles on the skin of a baby with eczema, that baby has a much higher chance of getting a peanut allergy. So that's a long answer to your question. I hope that helps. No, it's it really actually very helpful because it really plays nicely into I think a theme that we've developed over the past uh, decade or so, and that is that barrier disruption uh, leads to over-challenging of the immune system. We certainly have seen right. it with reference to the gut, and which is you know, certainly uh, first and foremost in, in food allergy or, or playing an important role in terms of allerg uh, allergen presentation uh, and ultimately the cascade of IgE and histamine release, et cetera. But you know, when you bring to our attention the role of the skin, I think it really helps uh, understand uh, you know, how we're treating our initial barrier and what we're doing to yes. our initial barrier to actually break it down. And, and ultimately, I think, plays into the whole notion of evolutionary slash environmental mismatch that yes. you wonderfully uh, uh, ex uh, delivered this <laughs> ex uh, explanation of how it would have been a good thing to learn about your environment by having negative reactions to uh, whether it was a sea urchin or a, a worm. Uh, but now, you know, these cascades have been uh, unnaturally amplified. So what was protective That's for right. us in, in the day, in our hunter-gatherer days, let's say, it was wonderfully protective for us yeah. to become insulin resistant. Because we, right. we got body fat, we would survive. Similarly, exactly. it was wonderfully protective that we would have these allergic responses, but That's now right. they threaten lives. And, and certainly, um, you know, the most uh, tragic event is anaphylaxis, when yes. the uh, immune system has been suddenly so uh, amplified in its response that people begin to drop their pulse rate, their blood pressure, and begin to lose the ability to even breathe. And I was very taken by the description in your book. Everybody has heard of an EpiPen. 
Yes. So um, I, I'm not sure how we segue to that. Yes. But um, the the original, uh, as you describe it, person who div- who synthesized or created uh, epinephrine was the same person who brought the first cherry trees to Washington D.C. That was, you know, when you put stuff like that in a book, it really makes puts a smile on people's faces. But let's, I mean, everyone has heard of the EpiPen. We know that's something that people with food allergies can be desperate for at times. So um, I, if, it would be very helpful, I think, for our viewers, before we talk about some of the creative things to keep these reactions from, sure. from happening, let's go through a five-minute uh, exploration of the EpiPen, uh, training people ahead of time as opposed to finally busting out and needing to know how to do it. The story you told about the boy at school who wasn't allowed access to it, and they finally allowed that. That's all really interesting information. So let's take a couple of minutes just to talk about this sure. life-saving treatment. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm glad you enjoyed the historical pieces that uh, we put into the book because that is so important. For me, that build, explaining the human content and how things came to be, I think is very helpful for people to understand this isn't always purposeful, that things happen and we also want to be compassionate. And the way that I got into this was inspired by patients. We always meet, need community-based participation and we need inspirations to help us. And those inspirations are really reflected in the story of epinephrine because epinephrine is the only drug right now that we know can reverse anaphylaxis. People try antihistamines like cetirizine or diphenhydramine. Those are known as Zyrtec and Benadryl respectively. But in the end, the only thing that really can stop a reaction is epinephrine. And there are a lot of different injectable devices. But I think it is important to know that to use an injectable epinephrine device, you do need to get trained by a licensed individual. Everyone can use one, everyone can get trained. And that's the whole purpose of the book is to also talk about the laws that now have been provided so that, for example, in New York City, all the ambulances carry an injectable epinephrine device. That's great, but previously that hadn't been done. So as we learn more about the importance of giving an injectable epinephrine device right away in anaphylaxis, We can try to infiltrate the schools and colleges and ambulances and emergency rooms to have it ready because it is so life-saving. Why is it so life-saving? Well, it really reverses that misdirected immune response we just talked about. With all that mucus and itching and redness and swelling, injectable epinephrine can get it down in a matter of seconds. So after giving it to yourself, you feel better within seconds. And if you don't, you can always give yourself a second injectable device. And we always tell people to carry two at any time and to make sure you know how to use it and to make sure that your loved ones know how to use it or your coach or your teachers. So if you have a bad reaction, what's a bad reaction? Well, that's wheezing when you really can't get a breath or you have hives for over half of your body or you're vomiting uncontrollably. And all these reactions usually happen. If it's a food anaphylaxis, it's gonna happen within the first two hours, typically, of an ingestion. And so people that know they have food allergies will carry, and they should carry, an injectable epinephrine device because there's accidental ingestions and they can happen throughout someone's lifetime. And you never want to take it for granted that even though there's good labeling laws, and we could talk about that if you'd like, when we talk about the labeling laws in the book, even that isn't perfect. So you still need to carry an injectable epinephrine device. You need to use it within seconds. If you start to develop wheezing, vomiting, hives, give yourself an injectable epinephrine device. And you do it in the side of the leg. Don't do it in the arm. You don't do it in other parts of the body. And why is that? Because the side of the leg has this beautiful muscle. And there's not a lot of fat around the side of the legs. So the epinephrine pen is only about that. Uh, thick um, in terms of its length. And then the diameter of the the EpiPen is only about three of your hairs. So people typically don't even feel it when it goes in. It's life-saving. You give it on the side of the leg. You let it go through uh, the body. It takes about four seconds to 10 seconds. It's not a lot of liquid. And then within about minutes, you should be feeling much better. And it's important to give. It's important to know how to give. And I think it's wonderful that now with that story, for example, with the boy that I talk about in the book, 
Now people are becoming more aware, but we need to make sure as physicians that the minute that someone's diagnosed with a food allergy, that we also prescribe an injectable epinephrine device. And what I'm really hoping is that insurance covers will ensure it completely and that we can get this democratized and that it will not cost anyone money to have to pay for a life-saving medicine like injectable epinephrine. Well, before we get to some of the uh, innovative ideas in terms of actual treatment, uh, I, I just I, I don't want to leave that topic uh, because I want to just say one last thing about it in, in terms of what you wrote about in the book. The guidelines are really excellent in terms of you've given the epinephrine, what should you expect? Could you give a second dosage? Should you call 911? Should you still yeah. make plans to... It's, it's all written out really very, very well. And I, I can only imagine uh, if an individual is walking around with an EpiPen uh, that there's got to be a lot of misunderstanding about exactly what I'm supposed to do with this thing and what if it works or it doesn't work, what should I be doing? And more, I would say more importantly, parents who are uh, in that position and teachers certainly as well, wanting to know what to do next. So you did an amazing job talking about that. Let's move on to the notion of treatment. And maybe we'll go back to Schoenfeld at the, at the turn of the century and the idea of, of using a, a concentrated egg sort of protein in order yes. to desensitize. That's let's, right. Let's start there and then sure. bring that up to the present. And then we can talk about some of the monoclonal antibody ideas. So we are very, um, we are really, um, excited about all the other options. It did start with Dr. Schoenfeld in the United Kingdom in London. And that was in the 1900s. When you think of it, that was pretty novel for him to be able to give egg back to that individual to try to educate the immune system and build up that immune muscle so that that child became less allergic to egg. And that was published in The Lancet. And that I think inspired a lot of people to try to use the same methodology to desensitize other individuals. And so in Italy and in Spain, they used it for milk. That was um, back in the early 1900s. And then it started to be used in the States in the 1980s, the 1990s. And then the first randomized clinical trial was done at Johns Hopkins and then again at Duke with Peanut. So it's been something that is history in the making. And we talk about that in the book. There've been a lot of people involved in this, but essentially, I call the book The End of Food Allergy because we are at that beginning of the end, that the first drug ever was approved by the FDA this past year. So there's a lot of hope and promise that science has delivered on here. And I realize we're in the middle of COVID and a pandemic, but while we're trying to face other diseases that still exist like food allergy, that that epidemic, at least the first domino has fallen, that there is now a drug for peanut. It's restricted for age. We still have a long way to go. We want to make this safer. We want to do it for multiple food allergies too, because most people have more than one food allergy. And we want to do this for all ages, but we're getting there. At least we have the first drug and now we need to do better and do other systems for immunotherapies. And with that are also these monoclonal antibodies, as you mentioned, that could be used in conjunction or alone to treat food allergies. So the basics there, omalizumab, for example, uh, Zolair, is that Zolair, right? Yes, exactly. It is a, a, a drug that you actually talk about in your book, um, not so much alone, but in combination with the other types of desensitization protocols that you've described, is a drug that is uh, a, an antibody that actually attaches itself to this IgE, the FC portion of the, IG, of the IgE, the antibody that's really mediating or partly mediating this whole allergic response, which leads to this explosion of histamine. So the, the notion there being, if we can bind that IgE with an antibody, it will reduce its ability then to cause this histamine explosion. So do you find that in, a, as a standalone might be effective or basically uh, in combination with the other ideas? Excellent question. And you explained it so well. I'm uh, very impressed with exactly the understanding of omelizumab is how you explained it. And we like to use it as a protective cover. Now, if you use it every day, you could reduce your allergic reactions. Not in everyone, though. However, what's very exciting is that 
it was given a breakthrough designation by our FDA recently to move forward in what we call a phase three trial. So for the people listening, I also want to have that hope and promise that pretty soon we'll know if omalizumab, this anti-IgE, can be used singly to treat food allergy or if it has to be used in combination. At Stanford, we used a lot of it in combination because we felt that it was important to give the specific foods that someone was allergic to, to be able to desensitize them under the cover of omalizumab to help decrease your side effects and safety issues with giving yourself the food allergen. But if you go low and slow and give the anti-IgE, we think that that's probably a really good way to help many people. A lot of people don't need anti-IgE. They can have the immunotherapy work without it. But I think for every person, they deserve choices. And for any given disease, it's nice to have, as a doctor, the ability to prescribe different types of immunotherapy, depending upon the individual that you're talking to. And so it needs personalized discussions with the families, with the children. Some people might want a patch to try first. Some people might want to try sublingual immunotherapy. Some people might want to try the oral immunotherapy with anti-IgE or not. And that's one of the things we talk about in the book is that the fact that each person is a little different. Some people have just food allergies and not other environmental allergies, but a lot of people do. And so for them, it's probably more helpful to use an antibody that affects all allergies like Japilumab, for example. And I want to make sure everyone knows that we are open to many different avenues of therapy because we need to test them in a rigorous way through clinical trials as to which ones work and which person better than others. We don't have all the answers yet, but at least in the book and now that I see the future coming, there's a lot of great trials that are going on to be able to help people have choices in the end. One other uh, part of the book, uh, or, or I think goal of the book that I think you clearly accomplished is there there's a, seems to be a, um, a, a sense of self-blame on the part of parents, perhaps with all due respect, mostly mothers, uh, about the fact that their children have developed food allergies, uh, whether it was what they did eat or didn't eat during pregnancy, uh, the fact that they chose a cesarean section, the fact that they did or did not breastfeed, oh, and uh, what they were eating during breastfeeding, et cetera. And you did a really terrific job in going through all of that in such a wonderful way as to offset the sense of blame. And there are some statistics, for example, that would indicate that C-section may be associated with increased risk of food allergy. And um, I'm fair to say that there is a, there might be a slight increased risk of food allergy with C-section. Yes. So, and that's really due to the microbiome, but that can be offset if you have breastfeeding and if you have good microbiome in your in your gut. So I want to make sure, you know, everything is balanced. Like I was saying before, now we have to take an active position to undo some of those environmental aspects that we might not be able to control. For C-section, oftentimes that's being used as an emergency procedure to help save the mom's life and the baby's life. So I don't want people to go through that guilt trip thinking that, oh gosh, you know, I now have to go through this destiny. That's not necessarily true at all. Many people that have C-sections don't get food allergy for their children. So there are ways to offset that. And that's one of the things I wanted to make sure was positive about the book, that it gave a list of to-do items so that for that we can control, we can change our behaviors in an active way, in a proactive way to help our families, to help children, to help people that we know that have food allergies and adults and children alike. But one of the key features as a doctor and as a pediatrician and as a parent that we all go through, I believe, is this guilt trip. And we always second guess ourselves and say, well, if someone has a disease or if someone got this or that, was it my fault when I was raising my child, whether or not that's a mom or a dad or the guardian. And the data clearly shows that it's not necessarily genetics, that about two thirds of babies are born now that when they get food allergies, not due to a family history. Many children do not have a family history of food allergies. They might have a family history of allergies, but that doesn't necessarily make it so that the child will get a food allergy. In addition, we talked about in the book that 
whether or not you ate a lot of peanuts when you were pregnant or you ate peanuts when you were breastfeeding, that doesn't mean that your child is going to get a peanut allergy. It used to be thought with a very small group of data sets, only 20 individuals, that if you ate peanuts when you were pregnant, that that was going to induce food allergies in your children. But in fact, they did a 500 person study and they found that that wasn't true at all. So a lot of the things that your readers and your audience might have heard about, what's important and what I really try to emphasize in the book is that in order for science to take root, you need really well-designed trials, but you also need large trials so that you've done it in many people so that whatever you find out and that you conclude, it can become a strong fact. And when the public digests a lot of science, it's hard to know, well, was that trial done in a small amount of people? Is it applicable to me? And what we try to say in the book is, here's what strong facts to take and here's what to do, because it's not your fault. Um, and it's not about what you ate or what you ate while you're breastfeeding or what you ate when you were pregnant. Well, that said, I mean, there, there is some evidence that there might be increased risk uh, associated, for example, with C-section. And the beautiful thing that you did is, as you just mentioned, you offer the offsets. So you required a C-section uh, because there was fetal distress or whatever, for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, along with that, C-section typically means antibiotics, i.e. another embarrassment to the microbiome. But that said, uh, you offer really wonderful offsets. So it, it did happen. It was a life-saving uh, requirement. And That's we're right. going to move forward now. Uh, and it's just very, very helpful when you can help people put aside this sense of trying to, you know, of blame, of self-blame or blaming yes. others for the reasons uh, that something, that there was a certain outcome. I think That's fair right. to say, though, uh, I'm, I'm, maybe you would agree that C-sections are, are a little bit overdone in um, certainly in America, certainly in Brazil uh, and other countries that are done yes. not for necessarily medically uh, required uh, reasons, but perhaps, I, I hate to say convenience, but for other reasons. Yes. That's I, it. Yeah. We know that a, 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 bo a child being born through the birth canal, canal is anointed with these primordial seeds for his or her microbiome. Uh, the wonderful work at NYU by Dr. Maria Dominguez Mello, yes. looking yes. at how valuable that really is. But exactly. uh, you know, again, you, you did such a wonderful job in, in saying, okay, that's the way it is, but here's what we can do moving forward. Take a deep breath and onward we go. Um, exactly. I, I like your word anoint. It's very important. I, I, did, I think it's her work. I it's, heard that word. I said, I'm going to use it yes. from now on. I'll, I'll pay homage to whomever uh, came it's up with excellent. it. Like it's excellent. It's excellent. It gives, it's, it's a great visual. That's um, right. You're well, right. There, there are, there are C-sections that don't necessarily need to happen. So we need to also discourage that practice too. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the big uh, discussion is how big will my scar be? Well, not my scar, yeah. the scar be. And yeah. uh, we know that you know, there are uh, a significant increase, there's a significant increased risk of certain autoimmune conditions in offspring born via C-section. Yes, that's right. Type 1 diabetes, um, celiac disease, uh, other autoimmune conditions. Yes. Well, I want to yes. cover a couple other points really quickly. And, and the first is, we, we know about celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but Let's be real specific about what it is you're talking about as it relates to food allergy, at least mechanistically, that might differentiate itself from food sensitivities, for example. Sure. You know, I think, you know, and as we speak about this, food is so important. Getting good, nutritious food that is uh, farm fresh and making sure that we eat well and not preservative foods and not fast foods, it's all important. But even someone who eats a really healthy diet, they could have food allergies, they could get food sensitivities or celiac. And we make that distinction in the book that not only now do we have better diagnostics for food allergy, but we can also differentiate food allergy from food sensitivity from celiac disease. And I encourage everyone to have discussions with their physicians because with enough research now in the past 10 years, there are blood tests that can distinguish these three things. And that's excellent. Because a lot of people suffer from food sensitivities and food sensitivities are like bloating, 
headache. There are a lot of neurological issues around some foods and chemicals like monosodium glutamate that can affect migraines, for example. Those are not food allergy. Food allergies where you're actually lighting up this molecule, this IgE, that's the match behind the fire, where within two hours you can get swelling and mucus production, and breathing issues. You typically don't get fever, you don't get a headache, you don't get bloating. So those are different symptoms than food sensitivities. Now there is some overlap. People with a food allergy and food sensitivities can get abdominal issues, can get diarrhea, can get vomiting. But a lot of the differentiation between food allergy and food sensitivities, if those symptoms overlap, is in the timing of those symptoms. So with food allergy, those symptoms are within two hours. With food sensitivities, those symptoms can happen long after two hours. And then with celiac disease, that's very much a genetically, as you know, um, predestined disease, although there are different forms of it. And there's a different set of diagnostics that helps patients with celiac disease, with biopsies. But all of these need to be finely diagnosed by experienced people. But hopefully by getting the right diagnosis, then that person can get on the path to better management. Because like I say to most of my patients on our first visit is, first thing I'm gonna do is try to be a good detective for you, is to make sure that I understand if you have a food allergy or food sensitivity or celiac, because those three things require a very different way to manage them but it's better to get the diagnosis right instead of sort of throwing therapies around before we know what we're treating. Uh, and for the longest about, time, it has been like that. Let, let's talk about your detective tools then. Um, people talk about the value of various types of testing in food allergy, including skin testing, uh, blood testing, looking at IgE, looking at even IgG, for example, and even um, you know, food challenging type of testing. And I think in the book, you, uh, I think food challenge was the gold standard by which everything else is judged. But we do uh, year after year see an ever increasing body of uh, blood tests available that are purportedly pretty accurate in terms of looking at this IgE response to particular foods. So what's the state of the art right now in terms of let's just start with blood testing? Yeah, the state of the art right now is really um, a mixture of diagnostic um, procedures that you have in your deck of procedures to do. For food allergy, it's typically skin tests done in a board certified allergist's office so they can interpret it well. You don't want to do this at home. You want to make sure you have someone that can interpret it and who does it well, technically. I love and the part about don't do it at home. Right, exactly. right, right next to the CRISPR machine in the garage. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and then in addition, the blood tests, a lot of companies will offer you blood tests that can be like point of care testing. They'll show you the kit at home and you do it at home. Those I would avoid. That's also, don't do that at home. Importantly, not yet anyway. It's not ready for home use. But when you go to the doctor and when you want to get a board certified allergist to interpret your test, that's what I'd recommend. Unfortunately, when people get these typical blood tests, the computer spits out an interpretation that looks at every IgE molecule and says it's totally high. And that's not necessarily the way to interpret those. So it's best to get it interpreted by a board certified doctor. So first skin tests, blood tests, and the blood tests are getting better now, which is great. There's something called component testing, and that's getting even more fine tuned to dissect out those types of IgE molecules that are more associated with anaphylaxis than not. So that's helpful. And then the last one, the gold standard is the food challenge, but that typically takes about five to six hours to do. So you don't see the average allergist doing that very often. You can't do it in the pediatrician's office or the internal medicine's office. So it takes a specialty office to do it. And there's a lot of backup for a wait list to get food challenges done. So oftentimes people will use the skin test and the blood test, which I think are fairly good. And all throughout the world, they're using those diagnostics. For the food sensitivities, that's still in the works. I, I think that those diagnostics are still um, at their sort of neonatal stage, but hopefully coming to be a better um, a CLIA approved lab so that we can use them more often. But I do think that when people are searching on the web, are looking at Google, if they see something that you're going to get a kit at home and that company's going to charge you for it, be very careful, buyer beware because for anything that your insurance will approve, 
and that a, a board certified allergist will do, those are the tests to do. Don't take this on via Dr. Google or some internet uh, kit that they want you to buy. There's one last area I'd like to cover, and it's uh, an area of uh, my personal interest, and I think a lot of our uh, uh, viewers are interested in vitamin D as well, and certainly in the context of uh, this current pandemic, vitamin D has been a, a real focal point for discussion as well. But you have a section in your book dealing with vitamin D, and uh, look, it mentions, for example, the degree, uh, uh, the prevalence increase as we move further away from the equator, implicating lack of sunshine. But why is uh, vitamin D likely involved in all this? And beyond that, if that's the case, what should we be doing about it? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I, I think having a good diet and having a good source of vitamins is so essential. And, and vitamin D in particular, because it helps the immune system stay strong. It helps the immune system have this balance where some parts of the immune system can become over-inflamed, but then other parts of the immune system regulate that. So there's this yin and yang of the immune system. And vitamin D kind of sits in this beautiful seesaw to balance that yin and yang. And vitamin D is that this fulcrum to help these two parts of the immune system to stay stable. And so having good amounts of vitamin D in your system helps the immune system regulate itself. That's important. You don't want to overdose on vitamin D. You don't need huge amounts of it for this to happen. The vitamin D that we typically get via the sunshine, if we were back in the day of our great, great ancestors where we were outside for eight hours a day getting beautiful sunshine, that would be enough vitamin D. Now to take it supplementary and in good vitamin D enriched foods is very helpful because we don't have that ability to go outside. Plus it could potentially induce other harm like skin cancer. So in those countries, for example, that had a lot of skin cancer like Australia, and they went to the degree which was appropriate to use sunscreen in their infants and all throughout their population, they did such a good job there that they became relatively vitamin D deficient. And Australia had one of the highest rates of food allergy. And we think it's because of this association with vitamin D. So now a lot of people are taking vitamin D enriched foods, but that's where that vitamin D plays a role. But all vitamins are important. I don't want people to think that they should take vitamin D at the exclusion of other vitamins. That's not the case, but just make sure that your levels are good. Um, and for each age, good is relative. So make sure that you talk to your pediatrician and your doctor about what's a good level of vitamin D for you. Well, I'm glad we, we got to touch upon that because we've been looking and talking about uh, looking at vitamin D for, for quite some time in its a role in terms of an uh, immunomodulator, getting to that yin and yang sweet spot that, that you were describing uh, as it relates to inflammation and the role of yes. inflammation in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's in multiple sclerosis that has a yes. very similar a geographic distribution as look at right. food allergy. So right. um, I wanna again, uh, thank you for our time together. Thank you for thank all you. the work that you're doing. You're doing some really great stuff. It's a team. It's a team effort, and I'm very grateful to be invited on your show today. And I hope we can speak again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nader. We'll talk soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, we learned a lot today about food allergies. We learned uh, about why it seems to be gaining in its prevalence around the world, how that might relate to lifestyle. Uh, and also about treatments, a lot about uh, the use of the EpiPen and uh, new drugs, uh, what we call immunotherapy, how that's been practiced actually for quite some time. I think that what we learn most uh, in looking at the book, The End of Food Allergy, is there's really a lot of hope. And uh, researchers like Dr. Nado are really giving us a, a lot of optimism in looking towards the future as it relates to food allergy. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll be back soon.